is Pandora Mondragon. I am a graduate student here at Cal Poly Pomona and I'm currently working on a research project that involves using cowpea as a cover crop. Cover crops are always, they've always been known to improve soil. You grow a cover crop when you're not growing your cash crop. Uh, the problem is that with a lot of small scale farmers in, urban, in an urban setting, they don't really choose to grow a cover crop just because it is an investment, it's an additional cost. And when you are growing in such a small scale, every square inch, it counts, right? So then you really want to be mindful of what you're going to be growing and if you can even, if it's even worth it to you. What we wanted to know is if we could grow a leguminous cover crop just to see if we can actually harvest it so it can be sold. And the way that we're testing this is we're going to be growing two groups of cowpea. So we're going to be growing cowpea in a traditional sense where we're going to be terminating it at 50% flowering, which is where you usually terminate a cover crop. And the common wisdom would be you want to terminate before it fruits because you want to preserve as much nitrogen as possible in the soil. And then we're finally going to be growing a cash crop to then measure the yield to see if there is any kind of difference. Because at the end of the day, that's the most important thing for small scale farmers to see if there was a difference in yield. But if we do see that there isn't much of a difference with the other group where we actually harvested the cowpea, then we can actually perhaps suggest growing something to the point where it fruits so that we could have two cash crops. So essentially creating a cover crop that's a hybrid between a cash crop and a cover crop and making that more profitable for small scale farmers, especially urban farmers. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to our virtual healthy soils demonstration day. I am Dr. Aaron Fox, a professor in the plant science department at Huntley College of Agriculture at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, I've been working in uh, organic agricultural research for about 15 years now. Um, my position at Cal Poly Pomona primarily for, uh, focuses on urban agriculture. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you about any of the items we discussed today. So you're more than welcome to send me an email uh, if you have any questions uh, at AFFOX at cpp.edu. In my talk, um, I want to give you all an update on our Healthy Soils demonstration project, which is titled uh, Building Healthy Soils for Transitioning Organic Farmers. Uh, but before I do that, I thought I would uh, just go over a little bit of what we're talking about when we talk about uh, healthy soils and um, also some of the uh, programs, the healthy soils programs that uh, the state of California is uh, currently supporting and incentivizing and promoting. So when we talk about healthy soil, what are we really talking about? Uh, we're talking about uh, the soil's ability to help us, right? The soil's ability to uh, support strong uh, crop growth and good yields. And that means that if we can rely more on the soil, uh, we have to rely less on fertilizers and other inputs. Also, the idea of uh, protecting our soil, right? Um, protecting and preventing things like erosion and compaction. Uh, a healthy soil is more resistant and uh, resilient to those types of uh, degradations. And then ultimately, you know, how do we measure this? What are we looking at? Um, there are physical, chemical, and biological parameters we're typically looking at. Uh, physical parameters like uh, soil structure, uh, soil aggregate strength, chemical uh, parameters like uh, pH or uh, macronutrients, micronutrients in the soil. Um, and then healthy soil also, you know, really has a strong emphasis on biological parameters, on the, the microbiome of the soil, all those uh, bacteria and fungi. You know, we often talk about how when you hold a, a tablespoon of soil, there's more organisms in that soil, in that tablespoon of soil, than there are people on the planet. Um, one proxy, sort of one way of measuring how healthy your soil is, is looking at the uh, percent soil organic matter. 
And when I show you some results from our project uh, later today, that's kind of what we'll be using as a measurement of soil health. So um, as your soil organic matter level goes up, as that percentage goes up, it's, a, it's showing that your soil is, is healthier, that you're uh, improving the uh, health of your soil. And so that's a, our goal, right, is to increase soil health. And what are some general rules on how to do that? Well, we have to talk about keeping the soil covered, right? Meaning that uh, once you have harvested your cash crop and instead of going into uh, just fallow where there's nothing growing on that field, we often talk about you know, growing uh, cover crops or maybe switching to a, a perennial crop that will cover that soil for a few years. Also, we can of course build organic matter in the soil by uh, putting crop residue and compost and other uh, materials, other organic materials in the soil. And then also a really important one is uh, reducing disturbance, reducing the tillage and plowing and uh, disturbance of the soil. All of these things can uh, build, maintain soil health, can uh, increase the soil organic matter uh, in your soil. And this is uh, just uh, an infographic from uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture, again, kind of emphasizing like why we should really be thinking about the health of our soil. Uh, as it says, um, and as we mentioned earlier, um, it has direct uh, benefits for our crop health and crop yields. Uh, it can also help us uh, retain moisture in the soil better. Um, it can um, prevent dust and erosion. And one of the big things right now is that uh, it can sequester greenhouse gases in the soil, right? Uh, it can take uh, carbon dioxide uh, out of the atmosphere where it's causing uh, climate change issues and it can lock it uh, in the soil. So it um, has real benefits for uh, not only the grower, but for all of us. And that's where a lot of uh, the money to promote these uh, healthy soil practices coming from uh, is from Cal the California's efforts to uh, mitigate climate change, primarily through uh, the cap, cap and trade system that's been in place um, for a while now in California. Um, those dollars are going towards the uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture Healthy Soils Incentives. So this is a program to uh, help farmers pay for uh, healthy soils practices. This is just some of the language taken from uh, CDFA's website and program. And I thought it would be worthwhile for me to just kind of show you um, the website and to kind of help kind of direct you um, because typically in the winter uh, around January, February of each year, uh, they've come out with new funding uh, to help incentivize and promote these healthy soils practices. And so uh, you as the grower or the landowner would um, apply to receive those uh, incentives uh, typically again in January and February. It's not clear what's gonna happen in 2021. Um, the carbon markets have been a little volatile and so we have to wait and see um, what kind of funding is available. But let's go to this website. If you don't have um, the opportunity to write this down, I can show you how it's actually very easy to find. Um, so if you just go to any search engine and put in uh, CDFA healthy soils, it'll take you right to um, the program. Now, again, for growers and farmers, you're wanting to look at the uh, incentives program. And so uh, again, check to see if this is uh, updated in the winter, uh, new funding opportunities will uh, be posted on this um, page here for the incentives. Now, I've had many folks ask questions about like, okay, well, what, what practices are actually being funded? Um, you can find it here on the website, but it is a little bit uh, hard to navigate to. So I can show you if you go to uh, current recipients and recipient resources. And if you go to last year's incentive program, you'll see requests for grant applications. And then um, the table of contents is right here, but what you're looking for is eligible agricultural management practices. 
And you'll see that, you know, based on kind of what you're growing, um, there's a whole list of uh, opportunities here. You know, you can put in uh, cover crops or uh, compost, um, you know, everything from uh, tillage management to hedgerows. There's a whole list here. If you're uh, doing orchards or vineyard, um, there's another list here and then grazing land has its own. And if you want more information on each of these practices, um, there's a link that describes what these are. But if you feel like um, you have questions, you're welcome to send me an email and I can either do my best to answer them or I can direct you to the uh, person that can, can answer them. So there's a lot of information on this page, on this uh, CDFA Healthy Soils uh, program page. Um, there's a lot of information just about the program and the impacts it has had. Um, it says that uh, of all of the uh, programs that have been funded so far, it's the equivalent of taking about you know, 25,000 cars off the road um, in the sense of uh, climate change impact. So what are we doing here at Cal Poly Pomona? Um, our project has been going on since 2017. This is a, a demonstration project. And many of you all that are watching this video now have come out to our demonstration days uh, in the late fall last year and the year before where we've given you updates on the, on the project out at the farm. And of course, this year, because of the pandemic, we're doing it here via video. So our thought was that uh, many of these healthy soil practices would be especially uh, pertinent to um, maybe organic growers that are uh, transitioning from conventional to organic. And that was our situation too. We had a nine acre field that we were transitioning to certified organic. So we took um, three sections of that field. And one of the sections we uh, applied uh, rye cover crop at a hundred pounds of seed per acre. And then uh, another section of the field, we put down um, compost at eight tons per acre. Uh, we've had questions about what does that mean cubic yards wise? That's about 16 cubic yards per acre. And that's a, a high carbon uh, compost, low nitrogen compost. And then we compared that to um, an eight, a few acres of the field where we didn't do anything. So that's what we were doing in the winter for the past few years. And in the summertime, we were growing uh, certified organic green beans. And we we're looking at, you know, do these healthy soil practices uh, impact the subsequent green bean yield? And then throughout this project for the past few years, we've been uh, measuring soil health, um, primarily looking at soil organic matter, but some other parameters as well. And then Dr. Phillips has been doing a, a cost benefit analysis that uh, you'll be able to hear um, his presentation on that later uh, in the video. So this is the field we're talking about. Again, this is um, Spadra Farm, just uh, a mile south from our campus in Pomona in Los Angeles County. Um, it's the first field um, when you come in off Pomona Boulevard. Uh, it's about nine acres, and we took about six acres uh, for this project. Um, our certified organic transition started in 2016, and we put the entire field into alfalfa for three years and that's the required uh, transition period. So we were um, managing this alfalfa uh, organically, no synthetic fertilizers or pesticides for three years. Um, and then we disked, ripped, mowboard plowed, uh, and then disked again to um, terminate that alfalfa and get ready for annual crop production. And so in Late 2008, early 2019, um, after getting rid of the alfalfa, we planted our rye, um, we applied compost soon after. And then in the summertime, um, OC Produce planted the entire six acres in uh, organic green beans. After those green beans uh, were harvested, uh, they were plowed under uh, and dissed, and then a rye cover crop was uh, planted in January of 2020, uh, and the compost was applied soon after. Now, this year, 
was different, like many things this year, uh, because of um, a number of logistical issues, we were not able to grow the entire uh, field and green beans this year. So instead we did small um, plots about uh, 50 feet by 50 feet um, of green beans um, over the different treatments. And those grew uh, throughout kind of the late summer and harvested in uh, September. This is something that I mentioned uh, in previous demonstration days, but um, the compost application actually presented a, a couple of uh, logistical barriers. There's a lot of really good quality compost in our area in Southern California, uh, and getting that compost to our fields is not a problem, but um, applying it to our fields, we learned, is actually a little complicated. Um, there's, of course, we can have the compost delivered, but to have it spread out over the field, um, that was something that we had a real challenge with in the beginning because, you know, we have a, a small front end loader and a, a manure spreader uh, at our farm on campus, but that's actually relatively uh, uh, small scale and it would have taken many, many, many days and be, have been um, very labor intensive to uh, use that equipment to spread over just two acres. Um, Fortunately, we did find a contract applicator. Ruben um, was a huge help. Um, and you see the kind of equipment that's necessary to really um, efficiently apply this material. So if you are considering uh, applying compost to your acreage, do uh, try and find uh, a contract applicator who can, can help you out with that. With uh, our cover crop, uh, our rye establishment, um, we, in the first year that we planted it, we planted in November before the rain started. And so we did uh, a pre-plant irrigation and then we did one post-plant irrigation before the rain started. Last year, we planted a little bit later in January and by that time the rains had started. And so we did no pre-plant uh, irrigation. Uh, however, if you all recall, uh, January and February were really dry months last year, and we were getting to the point where we thought we'd have to get the pipes and sprinklers out and irrigate that crop, uh, that cover crop, and that's a real big logistical uh, consideration, a big uh, labor and uh, electricity cost, etc. So um, we're not looking forward to that, but again, as you all recall, um, in March, it started raining again, and we were saved, essentially. Um, and so we had to do no irrigation at all to have a successful rye cover crop last year. Now, while I'll admit that um, our irrigation, the, the fact that we didn't have to really irrigate in the previous year, we didn't have to irrigate that much, you know, was a little bit due to luck. It does point out that there is an opportunity to plant this cover crop, you know, at a specific time to try and um, maximize uh, the benefit and minimize the irrigation needs. Something else that uh, we saw uh, last year and this year is that during that fallow period, the rye did a really good job of suppressing weeds. Um, while the rye was growing, uh, we really had no weed issues at all. And then right next to it in the compost and the control, the check, we had a lot of weed issues and we had to um, go in there during the fallow period and disc uh, weeds a few times. So that's an added benefit of, of the rye. And this year it was interesting because we actually had a lot of rye residue on the field. You can see in this photo here, left over after uh, we terminated it. And the main reason why we had that this year and not last year is um, because we really just uh, mowed and disced it this year. Uh, in the year before, we really plowed that under uh, with a mow board plow. So uh, you'll see that that residue might actually have uh, significant uh, implications for uh, our summer crop. While we were growing the green beans, you can see here we had significant weed pressure in the compost and the check. Um, and it took us about an hour to uh, each week to weed these uh, plots. And again, about 50 feet by 50 feet. Um, well, whereas in the rye, there was hardly any weeds at all. Uh, and it took us, you know, 75% less time to weed these plots. It's a huge difference. 
So instead of an hour, it took us about 15 minutes to weed the plot. And we're thinking that the rye ha is causing this, right? That um, either through some physical mulching effect or maybe even uh, an allelochemical effect, uh, it's reducing weeds. So rye naturally has uh, chemicals in the rye that um, help uh, prevent uh, weed growth. And so that, that may be the reason why we saw uh, so few weeds in the rye plots compared to the other plots uh, this year. Now, what you may also be seeing though, is that it looks like our green bean stand is a little spotty, right? Um, it's something that we thought too, and that the rye may not only be holding the weeds back, but it might've held the emergence of our green bean crop uh, as well. And so we did stand counts and that's exactly what we found is that um, there were far fewer green bean plants in the um, rye plots than in uh, either the compost or the control. Now, did this translate to uh, a yield loss? Um, it looks like it did a little bit. Our yields had a lot of real variability, um, you can see here, but it does look like um, the rye yield, you know, was a little bit less uh, than the compost, but it was not as big of a dramatic difference as the stand counts were. So that is interesting. I mean, it does kind of point to the fact that, okay, we need to be careful about um, the effect this rye can have on subsequent crops. But even though there may be a, a yield loss, um, the benefits, the weed management benefits might make up for that loss. So that's really interesting. Now, how did the soil health respond to these treatments? We were looking at percent cell organic matter um, when the, at the very beginning of the experiment when the field was in alfalfa, and then we looked at it um, a year later after we did a round of the healthy soils practices and a full summer of green beans. And then we did it again uh, this year. So um, August, September of 2018, 2019, and 2020. As I reported uh, last year, soil organic matter went down uh, across the board, across all treatments uh, from when we went from alfalfa to an annual cropping system. And my assumption is that a lot of that has to do with the uh, heavy tillage and plowing and disturbance of the soil that we had to do to transfer uh, to transition from alfalfa to annual crops. What about uh, during the past year? So from uh, 2019 to 2020, we saw an increase of soil organic matter uh, across the field, uh, including in the control. So that does point to the fact that some of this may just be due to the environment, but um, some of it may have to do with the uh, healthy soil practices as well. And one way to kind of uh, maybe take a better look at this is just to look at um, what was the change? What was the change in soil organic matter? And so as I pointed out, um, in 2019, there was a drop, right? A reduction in soil organic matter across the entire field. But what you do see is that there was less of a drop in the compost and the rye. And maybe that's showing that these healthy soil practices can act as a, a buffer, right? That even though there may be a lot of uh, tillage and plowing and disturbance that can uh, weaken soil health and reduce soil organic matter, um, by adding those healthy soil practices, you can uh, buffer a little bit against those negative uh, uh, actions. And then this past year, when we saw an increase in soil organic matter, uh, similarly, we saw a greater increase in the two healthy soil practices part of the field in the compost and the rye. And finally, one way to look at this is just to see from when we started to where we are today, um, what, what does the soil health look like? What does the soil organic matter look like? And you'll see that there really has not been much of a change at all in the control where we have done nothing except plant green beans, but there's been um, a big increase in soil organic matter in the compost and the rye. 
So in conclusion, it looks like these uh, practices, compost and a rye cover crop, do seem to improve soil health some over uh, a control check where you're doing nothing. Uh, rye does have some interesting additional benefits related to weed management. Uh, when it's growing, it outcompetes weeds. Um, when it's been terminated and there seems to be you know, residue left at the surface, it seems to uh, reduce uh, weed emergence. And again, it may also suppress uh, cash crop growth and establishment, but that may uh, be balanced out by these weed management benefits. So as I conclude, uh, I'd like to thank the collaborators on this project, uh, Dr. John Phillips, who you'll be hearing from later, as well as Dr. Uh, Valerie Milano, both from uh, Cal Poly Pomona's Huntley College of Agriculture, uh, Rachel Searles and Ramiro Lobo from UC Cooperative Extension, AG Kawamura and everybody at OC Produce. And then there have been a, a whole number of students that have made this project possible, uh, Pandora uh, on Dragon, Daryl Mixon, Ava Hansen, Ingrid Zaragoza, uh, Jake, as well as a whole number of uh, students who have volunteered at previous demonstration events. Uh, this has been a real great opportunity for our students and this project uh, wouldn't have been possible without them. Special thanks to uh, Renee Murphy, one of our graduate students that has made these demonstration day events possible the past few years, including this uh, video virtual demonstration event. Um, and then, of course, uh, thanks to our uh, funders, uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture's Healthy Soils Demonstration Grant, and additional funding from uh, so SoCal Gas's Environmental Champions Grant that uh, provided funding for additional students to work on this project. Again, I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, so please send me an email, and thanks again for tuning in. selection. Well, we started with over 60 different varieties, or not varieties, but lines of tomatoes. And from there, we narrowed down to 12 specific plants we liked from a few select lines. And we're just monitoring how they do in an organic environment. We're tracking traits like fruit quality, total yield, how well they resist disease and insect pressure, how tolerant are they to drought and heat. And yeah, that's primarily what we're doing. So there are specifics for each of those characteristics, but we aren't doing any like molecular marker screening or anything like that. For fruit quality, yeah, it's all visual. Um, we do bricks, which is measuring like sugar and acid content. But as far as like blemishes and stuff, you can just spot that by eye and then there's a grading system to that. It's all gonna be about management practices and really bringing down like the labor and input costs. Um, to be competitive with conventional. If, it, if that can be achieved, then it'll do just fine. Hello, folks. Welcome to the presentation. I'm Dr. John C. Phillips with the Agribusiness and Food Industry Management Agricultural Science Department at Cal Poly Pomona University. I hope you find this presentation interesting as well as informative. Today I'm going to be talking about the cost and benefit analysis of our healthy soils field trials on Spadra Farm in which we produced organic green beans. I'd like to mention my co-authors, Dr. Aaron Fox, who was the instigator and the innovator of the project. Deborah Nardo, graduate research assistant, and Dr. Valerie Milano. The other three co-authors are with the plant science department. These are some of the topics that I'm going to be talking about today. Giving a brief introduction to my to myself as well as background for the project, what we were trying to accomplish with our research, 
the framework for our cost and benefit analysis, as well as the methods for implementing it. I'll be focusing on the 2019 production of green beans over at our Spadra farm. And I will give the cost and benefit res results for that year. I will also provide some conclusions and end up with some acknowledgements. I started in studying agriculture in 1996 and joined Cal Poly Pomona in 02. I am a member of several professional organizations. I've got five peer reviewed journal articles over the course of my career as either an author or a co-author. And I've, I've done numerous research presentations at professional conferences, including throughout the United States, as well as in four other countries. Prior to becoming a certified organic, in our field, we grew uh, organically managed alfalfa. Then, starting in 2019, we had three treatments with a rye cover crop, compost, and a control or check. So two treatments with added inputs, as well as one treatment with neither. And after applying those extra inputs in late summer of 2019, our, our industry partner, OC Produce, planted and managed our organic green beans on the uh, two acre plots of each of the three treatments. So as I mentioned, here are three treatments, a little bit more detail. In planting the rye, we used 100 pounds of seed per acre. With regard to the compost, we applied eight tons per acre, approximately 16 cubic yards. And then once again, on the control or check two acre plot, we did neither of those. With regard to the rye, we, we did a little bit of uh, supplemental watering for the cover crop that wasn't done on the other two treatments. So the, the framework for our costs and benefits is that you uh, basically on this graph, you've got the output on the vertical axis in terms of dollars and the input, the quantity of the variable input is on the horizontal axis. As long as the marginal or additional amount of revenue that you get is greater than the marginal input cost, you continue to increase your use of the variable input until such time labeled on the graph as C star, that is the optimal level of your variable input in which you are maximizing your profit. So in, in deciding how much inputs to use, your goal is to, to seek out that C star point where the, the orange line crosses with the horizontal marginal input cost line. What method did we use in our project? As I mentioned, we were collaborating with OC Produce and they basically ran the production of the green beans after we prepared the, the, food, uh, the fields with uh, using our Cal Poly Pomona farm crew and director of farming operations. 
those two entities provided us with cost and yield information. We obtained previous uh, research results from UC Davis, UC Cooperative Extension, specifically Molinar, Yang, Klonsky, and Demora did uh, a study providing sample costs to produce green beans. And that was in 2005. Using that framework, we adapted it for organic production practices. For example, they were allowed to use certain inputs that were not allowed under organic management. So we eliminated those from the costs because we did not use those. Furthermore, we, we had three uh, levels of results, one for each treatment, the controller check, the compost application, as well as the rye cover crop. So in the, the cover crop, as well as the uh, compost, there, there were additional costs above and beyond the, the generic control or check treatment. Finally, we monitored market prices at uh, the time of harvest and those the prevailing price was used to calculate revenues. Moving along into our results, first of all, we'll deal with the costs. And we had incremental costs for the rye cover crop. Those came to a total of $436 per acre. I'm going to omit the cents just for the sake of simplicity. And those costs were distributed among purchasing the seed, planting the seed, watering the rye, plowing under the rye, rye incorporating the cover crop back into the soil at, at the end of that time period, as well as the incremental interest on operating capital that resulted from this incremental $436 per acre. With regard to the uh, compost application, the costs were higher at $1,048 per acre. And those were for the, the material, the compost material, as well as spreading the material over the field, as well as once again, the incremental interest on operating capital. One encouraging result that we had uh, in terms of the benefits is that there were incremental benefits from both the compost application as well as the rye cover crop. As you can see here in the top one third of the slide, the, the baseline control produced 292 30 pound boxes of green beans per acre. The compost, produced 324. So that this was a, a greater amount of yield using the compost and the rye cover crop had the greatest yield at 397 30 pound boxes per acre. Converting the yield to revenues, we multiplied by $28, which was the prevailing price during the time of harvest. So the revenue per acre for the control was $8,193. For the compost treatment was $9,085. And for the rye treatment, $11,123. If you recall from the graph of the framework slide, we're concerned not with totals rather, but uh, instead we are concerned with the marginal qu quantities in terms of revenues and costs. So let's take a look at the, the marginal revenues. That is how much additional revenue you got by applying the compost. And likewise, how much additional revenue you got by growing the rye as a cover crop. With regard to the compost, the difference between 
the revenue for the compost and the control, $9,085 minus $8,193 equals $891. That represents the additional money you got by selling your output from the compost compared to what it would have been had it been in the control and not used the compost. Second treatment, rye as a cover crop, $11,123 minus $8,193 equals $2,929, which represents the incremental or marginal revenue you get from using the rye as a cover crop as uh, an additional input or activity. So the net profit or loss. For the compost, the marginal revenue was actually less than the marginal cost. The marginal revenue was $891 and the marginal cost was $1,048 leading to a net loss for doing the compost as an input of $157. The other treatment, the rye, the marginal revenue was $2,929 minus the incremental cost, which was a more moderate $436 led to a positive figure or net profit of $2,492 per acre from the rye cover crop. Let's take a look at our conclusions. So in this study, we demonstrated the costs and the benefits of healthy soil practices for uh, organ uh, organic green bean production focusing on the healthy soils practices of applying compost and using rye as a cover crop. Under the conditions of this study, the rye cover crop looked like a promising uh, and profitable input. There are some caveats or reservations, however, that is, first of which, ecological conditions can vary. We lucked out in that there were rains when we were growing the rye cover crop and the additional irrigation, the additional water that we applied to the cover crop was minimal. So it didn't add that much cost to the cover crop. This, this may not be the same in other years. It may be a drier year and the rye may require more, more water, more irrigation, which would, would change the, the cost and benefit relationship. The second caveat is this, res, this report is for a single season. Please note that the compost that we applied to the field, that's not going away it's still gonna be there in subsequent seasons. Presumably it's gonna provide benefits in subsequent seasons. So that would influence the returns or um, you know, the money returns that you get in the second season. So you can't, uh, you can't make a definitive uh, judgment just based on one season particularly for the compost. You could look at the compost more as uh, an investment in the field. You're, you're improving the field over time and you're gonna reap those rewards over multiple seasons. An additional caveat is that we, we just uh, tested a single level. That would be the uh, 100 pounds of seed for the rye cover crop per acre, as well as the eight tons of compost per acre. As you recall from the, the framework slide, it was a continuous function. So to, to get a better picture, 
you would uh, repeat the study at different input levels to figure out what the optimal level was. A fourth caveat is that costs and prices may vary based on market conditions. You may be able to get compost at a cheaper or more expensive uh, cost for the farming operations. Likewise, the individual labor costs for planting the seed for spreading the compost and so forth may vary. That's not to mention the price of the green beans may vary. Even at the, the given the costs that we experienced in the 1990, uh, 1919 growing season, had the cost of green beans been higher, sufficiently high, it would have made the compost treatment profitable in addition to making the rye cover crop even more profitable. The implication of, of those caveats is that more study is needed for different levels of rye seeding as well as different levels of compost application, as well as ascertaining the long-term benefits, the multi-year and multi-season benefits from doing these healthy soil practices. A general conclusion, there was substantial interest among federal, state, as well as local agencies in our field days that we had in both 2018 and 2019. There were community partners who assisted us and attended the field days, as well as local practitioners. There was interest among the students, both attending the field days as well as working on the project as student assistants, helping with the research, as well as student, uh, student workers helping to produce the organic green beans. So I thoroughly enjoyed working on this project and I, work, I uh, look forward to continuing uh, with wrapping up the project. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the funders of our grant, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, the information is included. Uh, we received additional funding from SoCal Gas. Cal Poly Pomona administered the, the grant. We had some collabor collaborators, including A.G. Kawamura from OC Produce, Ramiro Lobo, Dave Matias, as well as Rachel Searles. We had some outreach collaborators, USDA, NRCS, Inland Empire Research uh, Resource Conservation District, as well as Planet Earth Observatory. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge all our student assistants and workers whose names are listed, as well as the student outreach part participants who presented at our outreach events. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Hi, my name is Susie Kirchner. I'm the programs manager at the Inland Empire Resource Conservation District. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about the importance of understanding your soil. Like I mentioned, I work with the Inland Empire Resource Conservation District. We are a local government entity um, located in Redlands, California, and we serve what's collectively known as the Upper Santa Ana Watershed. Um, our mission is really to work on protecting the natural resources within our district boundaries. So a lot of our work focuses on sustainable agriculture and supporting local farmers. We also have programs focused on forest health, forest health and fire prevention, as well as habitat health, open space preservation, and education and outreach to residents in our service area, including um, students K through 12. So this map shows our district boundary. We have a pretty large district going out east towards Banning um, and then west out to the LA County line. There are two resource conservation districts, one to the north and one to the south of us, um, but there is no RCD in the LA region, which 
which is why we sometimes try to provide um, support and outreach to those areas as well. In 2018, we began a program, a free program for farmers in our area um, with really two goals in mind. So the first reason we started this program was to really just give us a way to communicate and start meeting new farmers. Um, so by offering this program, it was really a way for us to outreach to farmers and be able to provide information on programs and information that will help them preserve their natural resources. And the second reason is to really just get them information on their soils, have them better understand what's going on beneath the soil, um, where they need support in, in building nutrients, organic matter, and so on. So for this program, we um, our sustainable agriculture specialist, Lucy Seha, who's shown in these images below, she goes out and meets with the farmer. She talks to them about their concerns. Um, and then she actually will physically collect the soil sample, send it to the lab. And then when the results return, she goes over the results with the farmer. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about why it's important to test and understand your soils. Um, there are several reasons. The main one is that through testing, you'll be able to really understand the pH level, organic matter content, and nutrients available to the plants that are being grown. Um, knowing this information enables the farmer or gardener to make educated decisions on how to manage for that plant and ensure that it has the correct nutrients. Um, it also provides in information on the need for fertilizer. Um, oftentimes, farmers over apply or sometimes under apply um, because they're applying it on a regular schedule and not because the soil results are telling them to. So by providing these tests, we are able to provide um, more accurate information on what's actually going on in the soil. So here's just an example of a soil test result that we've got in and some of them are even so simple where like in this chart, it'll tell you if the nutrient level you have is very low, medium, or very high. So if the farmer maybe doesn't know what these numbers mean, they can see just by looking where they need to improve. Um, and the, the test results include organic matter, pH, as well as the common nutrients. So one of the items we test for is pH. Um, plants do typically have a range that they prefer and thrive in. And one of these reasons is just that pH um, can affect the plant's ability to uptake nutrients. So the range that we are typically looking for is between a 5 and 7 pH, so slightly acidic to neutral. So the test results will come back telling us what the pH level is and if it's severely out of this range, we can work with the farmer um, to, to make adjustments. And the second item that we look at is organic matter. Um, and there are a lot of benefits of organic matter for the soil, including just um, retaining nitrogen and other key nutrients, forming better soil structure, retaining water. So the, the benefits are really limitless and the tests do allow us to um, detect the percent organic matter in that soil. Typically we do measure um, different depths of soil and so you're gonna find a little more organic matter in the top layer. We also test some of the key macronutrients, so that includes nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, nitrogen, for example, really promotes leafy growth. Phosphorus is important for flowering, fruiting, root growth. Um, so each of these has a really key role in the plant's development. And any limitations in these um, nutrients being available to the plant can greatly decrease productivity. So we test for these and give the results to the farmer. Here's just some symptoms of macronutrients in plants. So when you're just looking at the plant, it can be a little difficult sometimes to detect what exactly the nutrient deficiency is. That's where testing really comes in handy. So here's examples of what nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium might look like in a plant, but there are other nutrient deficiencies that might look similar. So if you're having a lot of this you know, discoloration or a leaf issue, a soil test is really going to be what, what tells
tells you what's going on in the soil. Um, so we sometimes also do test for secondary macronutrients. So those include like calcium, magnesium, sulfur, um, and then there's also micronutrients that are involved in plant productivity, such as zinc, iron, and boron. Um, this image to the right, I think, is kind of interesting because when you're looking just at the plant, sometimes you can somewhat detect what nutrient is lacking based off what leaves are being affected. So um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium are known as more mobile um, nutrients. And so typically, if you're seeing older, larger leaves affected, it's going to be one of those nutrients. Whereas if you see some of the young leaves just developing with issue, um, it might be one of those micronutrients um, listed at the top there. So plants can tell you a lot of what's going on, but really the soil uh, results are what's going to tell you what is happening in your soil. So that's all I wanted to really share um, right now about um, the purpose of soil testing and what we do through our program. I wanted to quickly throw up on the screen um, our contact information. So again, I'm Susie Krishner. I'm the program's manager. Um, and then Lucy is our sustainable agriculture specialist who really does a lot of the implementation of this work. Um, but before I wrap up, we're going to transfer this presentation into a video that Lucy uh, prepared for outreach to farmers, talking a little bit more about how she goes through doing the soil testing and what the purpose is. So thank you, and please watch the following video. Hi, my name is Lucia Seha, and I am a sustainable agriculture specialist for the IRCD. Did you know that the IRCD offers free technical assistance to farmers that live in our district boundary? That means that you get a free soil testing or a moisture sensor for free or not. Today, I'm going to show you how I go to your farm and take a soil sample screen. But first, let's talk about why soil sampling would be beneficial to your environment. Healthy soil yields healthy crops. Soil testing lets farmers know their soil nutrient and pH level so that they can make a security adjustment to their soil management plan. The end result is soil that is better suited to support high yielding, high quality health. The bottom line is it saves you time, money, and effort. It's a good deal, right? IUCD is here to help you. So when you decide that you want to take advantage of this free service, the first thing that you can do is get me a coffee. Again, my name is Lucy. You can reach me at 909 285 Four seven five four, or at El Solorzano at IRCD.org. I'll set up an appointment to meet you at your farm. Before I go, I'll check NRCS root system to make a soil map detailing the different types of soil in your land, such as sandy, clay, or salt. Based on this map, I'll decide how many samples to collect and where on the property they should be obtained. Then I'll take my equipment to your farm and start digging. Usually, I create anywhere between 10 to 20 holes to collect them. The soil samples are mixed together and go into a bag, which I'll send off to the lab. Once the lab analyzes your sample and sends back the results, I help you use them to identify any problems with your soil, how they affect your crop, and come up with a solution. And it's easy as that. If you'd like to learn more about our soil testing, such as what to we check for, please visit our website www.ircd.org or give me a call.